Okay, let's get started. Welcome. Um, as I said, the presentation is going to be in two parts, um, or two parts to, to, to today's webinar. Um, we're going to discuss um, disciplined long-term investor, and the second part would be um, the five retirement myths that can spoil a happy retirement. So our ultimate goal is, as investors is to have peace of mind um, with our, our investments and our retirement and things like that. But saying that retirement and your income in retirement is all about choices, and every decision has a ripple effect. Um, so there'll be a lot of questions today around uh, around those those decisions you make. So it's all about what are you willing to compromise on to make that master plan, your master uh, investment plan work. Now, if you're about five years away from retirement, it's time for you to go through a thorough uh, financial checkup um, and obviously to, to go through the numbers, put it that way. Um, and the question I can also ask today is, are you ahead or behind the game? And how realistic, how realistic is that five-year number? So remember, it's all that peace of mind. Uh, most, and we'll talk about it in the next slide, next few slides, we'll talk about the problem. Uh, most people don't have enough don't have a, a good enough sense of how much it really requires to retire to retire so whether you've been spending decades or years and years um, planning for your retirement or your golden years or you're just starting to become more serious about it you know if you had to go talk to financial advisors the first thing they'll do is examine um, all aspects of your financial picture now i'm not a financial planner so uh, that's my disclaimer up front um, so everything I'm talking in this presentation is for education purpose only. But imagine the, the financial plan is going to sit down with you, is going to ask you things about how much retirement savings you've got, about your estate planning, your insurance needs, and obviously your housing. All those kind of things comes into um, the, the picture. So the, the idea today is to, and I think that I always refer to Warren Buffett, as someone I always um, look up to. Here's a quote from Warren well, Four quotes from Warren Buffett says, regarding uh, long-term investing. You only have to do a few, do a very few things right in your life, so long as you don't do too many things wrong. Okay, so that's some food for thought. Number two, uh, obviously, and I think this is one of his big uh, secrets. He's a long-term investor. Our favorite holding period is forever. <laughs> okay, only when you combine sound intellect. With emotional discipline, do you get rational behavior? And the fourth quote here from Warren Buffett, the secret of a long-term investment success is benign neglect. In other words, you know, you're keeping an eye on it, so you're a bit kinder, but don't try to be too hard. Much success can be attributed to inactivity. So, and we'll talk about it a bit later when we talk about uh, the long-term investing. So what is the problem? What is the current situation? A position for a lot of people. Now, today, if you mention the word retirement, it sends to the average pre-retiree, you know, his mind goes really. You know, he's got a question like, will I have to work forever? Will I uh, outlive my money? Okay, we talk about longevity just now, but that is a big problem for a lot of people, they're outliving their, their funds. Will I be a burden on my children as medical aid costs uh, consume all my all my resources, all my funds. So those are just some of the questions if you had to ask a lot of people regarding your retirement. That's what, uh, what pops into mind. So most of the time, right before you retire, you had the highest discretionary income in your life. Um, I'm not there yet, um, but a lot of people, um, you know, my, my age, the children are much older, and some of them have left their, left their home already. My children still live with me, and they're still very young. But... Uh, most people um, get into that stage now where children have left their house and you might be in a situation where you've got two incomes coming in. So this is the, the stage where you, the highest discretionary income is in your, in your life at this point in time. So you're having lots of fun, uh, eating, having dinner out with your friends, you're going on holidays, you've got nice cars, life is grand. Okay, this is the current situation uh, you might be finding yourself in. But um, you know, the idea is that uh, you want to be able to do this full time. So the challenge comes in when you go meet up your, with your financial advisor and then the bad news it knocks home. As I said just now, that uh, we ask all those, those little questions. Uh, we find that we haven't saved up enough or our nest egg is not big enough. Um, and that's a problem for a lot of people. 
So, and this is where the questions come in. So, yeah, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, and this is a quote from Owen Arthur, um, in retirement is medical aid costs, healthcare costs. Uh, apart from tax and, and medical aid costs, uh, those are the things you have to worry about. But a quote from, from Owen Arthur, for he who has health has hope, and he who has hope has everything. So there's no use having all this money if you don't have the health. So um, obviously you want to be able to, to have the medical aid and the best uh, hospital care in place, but that costs money. Okay, so what is the ideal position? So the idea is to build up a big enough nest egg or a big enough asset base that's going to give you enough income. And we'll talk about the different uh, vehicles just now. But, and I mentioned this in about two, three weeks ago, we spoke about uh, how much income you would need. For every 4,000 rand a month in income, you need at least 1 million rand in capital. So 4,000 rand income, you need a, a thousand, uh, sorry, a million rand asset base or nest egg. 8 million, 8,000 8, rand, 2 million, so it goes on. So as I said, um, <laughs> you need to build up an asset class first of all. The other thing you have to take in consideration is the tax. So obviously you build up an asset class and then from there you can have, have, have income. Uh, the the uh, receiver taxes income. So you have to have a very important aspect is your tax. So you need a tax efficient vehicle. So this is, um, and, and I'll speak about him just now again, Robert Kiyosaki, he always talks about uh, your balance sheet. So on the one side, you've got your assets, on the other side, you've got liabilities. So yes, you've got rental property. And you might have shares, local shares, you might have an offshore portfolio, you might have a pension fund with your, your company, a problem fund, uh, retirement annuities, endowments, unit trusts, you might have business interest, I have a lot of um, online business interest, you might have cash in the bank, um, interest bearing securities. So these are just some ideas that you want to build up to form that nest egg. Um, at this point in time, you must uh, have your property, you must have a bond in your property. Remember, this is not getting, this is not a, or I don't consider your, the house you, that you live in as a asset. If you've got, especially with a bond on it, to me, and, and Robert Kiyosaki talks about the same thing, definition of an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. Liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. Okay, so I don't view my home I live in as an asset at this point in time as a liability. I don't, I'm not getting any income from it. You might have still have some uh, motor vehicles and, and uh, uh, car payments on that. Uh, credit cards, clothing accounts, revolving credit, overdrafts, loans. The idea is obviously to decrease your liabilities by the time you get to retirement age. You don't want to pay out of your assets, pay off your liabilities. So, um, so that's the balance sheet. Secondly, obviously, you want to set up a what I call an income statement. So you got your income from all those investments. So you, you convert your pension and your profit and all that kind of stuff into a living annuity and you'll draw a, a fund from that. But also, you're going to draw from all these other different investments, let's say endowments, your, your shares. Remember there we're talking about dividends, unit trust, we we're talking about unit trust just now, rental income, interest income, and obviously payments from your business interest. But it's also very important when we talk about expenses, yeah, we talk about necessities. So necessities, necessities you know, as I say, I'm assuming by the time you get to retirement that your bond is paid off. So, uh, yes, we, we've taken care of shelters. I've, I've, I've made that assumption already. You might have moved into a townhouse complex or a retirement uh, uh, home or whatever the case might be. There might be levies that you have to pay. But all of us need food. All of us would need medical aid. You have to look at, take in consideration, consideration other insurance needs. You have to pay water and lights, uh, rates and taxes, petrol and things like that. So those are some of the, I would say, necessities. But also, you want to be in a situation where um, I want to plan for my holidays. You know, retirement is the days that you want to enjoy your life. So yeah, I might want to have three holidays a year. I still want to be able to have my country club membership, my golf club membership. I love my Jamison whiskey. I might upgrade from the uh, normal, uh, uh, traditional run of the mall Jamison more to the 18 year old whiskey. Um, I like to get eat more dinners more often with my friends. And also, I might have a wish list. You know, I always had uh, the, the dream of sailing around the world. So maybe my sailing boat um, on weekends, I like to go make a noise around the neighborhood with my AC Cobra, but also things like personal development. I love courses and books and, and, and seminars, so, but that all costs money. So the idea is that, um, yes, we've got the necessities on the one hand, 
Um, remember also, you need to take into consideration your cost of living is going up. So all these things regarding inflation, you have to make aware, uh, make uh, uh, allowance for that. So now on our income side, as I say, you need to uh, look at what's coming in. And then what you need to do is compare the two. Compare your income to your expenses. If the expenses are below your income, in other words, you've got a surplus, then go back to the beach and enjoy your margarita. However, if your expenses are above your income, we've got some work to do. Okay, we've got a shortfall. So um, we need to see what that difference is, and obviously we need to, to, to cut back on something. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Is uh, And as I say, here's a quote from Robert Kiyosaki. Um, someone I, I really admire, is one of my favorite authors. I've read many, or most, or well, I think I've read all his books by now. Uh, quote from Robert Kiyosaki, and he's the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, the more money that goes into my asset column, the more my asset column grows. The more my assets grow, the more cash flow income grows. And as long as I keep my expenses less than my cash flow from the assets, I will grow richer with more and more income from sources other than my physical labor. In other words, I'm creating more passive income. Okay, so it's all about cash flow. Okay, I hope that um, makes you, you know, opens up some eyes and uh, hopefully motivates you to get into that kind of situation. So where do we want to be? As I say, you want to be in a situation where um, you've got this cash flow coming in, number one, and number two, you've got a whole range of different investments that's going to give you that, as I always say, choice, and choice means opportunity, gives you that flexibility, and to me, um, you know, having that, the time freedom and financial financial freedom, and that's what it's all about. You have to do what you want to, when you want to, how you want to, who you want to. That's where oh, I think all of us want to be, and that's that peace of mind. Okay, yeah, so how do we get there? Um, the idea here is, oops, sorry, I've gone too fast here. Um, this call it six rules, and as I said just now, I'm not a financial planner. Uh, this is not advice. Um, I, I actually got this. This, uh, this idea I got from Forbes. If you click on this, it goes into more detail. But the, and this is, I think it's uh, what, what I like about this. Pro, it's a process. It builds on the previous uh, previous rule or previous step. So we've really spoken about having a long-term philosophy, but I'll go into it again. Now, there's, there's two investment philosophies in the world. You can either believe that you have a high probability of beating the market. Okay, and I always say you, you want to be in a situation where you want to beat the market consistently. Or you don't. So, so you fall into those two investment philosophies. Um, if you believe that, uh, you know, and I've decided this long time ago myself that uh, markets are more efficient at pricing, uh, at pricing and such, the pricing securities, than I could ever hope to be. Um, you know, I don't have the skill to consistently add uh, value to my portfolio by picking mispriced uh, shares, number one, or the industry, or the country, if I want to go offshore, um, or entire markets. So I've come to a state where I'm, I'm happy being a long-term investor. I'm happy being a, um, call it a value a value and a growth investor um, but my whole idea is that you know I believe that market returns is all I need if I can outperform, outperform inflation and outperform the bond market by a healthy uh, uh, margin I'm happy with that that's my philosophy okay but the idea is that I do have more of a longer term philo uh, investment philosophy and we're going to more detail just now the whole idea is that that and this boils on to the second question it's, I believe it's more important to have a prudent asset allocation. We talk about asset allocation. It's just a, how your portfolio is diversified amongst different asset classes. Now, obviously, today's presentation is mainly on the equity side, okay, equity related. You also talk about physical property. You talk about cash and bonds, physical cash, uh, and other interest bearing securities. As I, said, I mentioned just now, phys, uh, you know, business interests. Um, and then what's important is to you know, fit this asset allocation into your long-term financial goals. That's a, and it works on, per, on percentages. So, for example, I'm using, the, again, this is not a uh, advice, suggestion. Let's say, for example, you might put 50% of your funds or 50% of your, you might be allocating to, to um, equities. You might allocate 15% of all your funds into property, physical property, rental property. You might have might like to keep 10% in cash, uh, and that can be cash in the bank here, cash in dollars overseas, wherever the case might be, um, if you have an offshore account. 
And also business interest, you know, maybe putting 25% of your money into different business interests and things like that as a suggestion. So it all works on, 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 on fixed percentages that you stick to over a period of time. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, instead of reacting to market uh, turbulence, you actually stick to your, your asset allocation. That's where uh, it's, it's important. But it's also important... And this goes back to what I said just now, that one segment just on the equities. You want to select low-cost unit trust funds that represent asset classes in a different allocation. So that's one way also of diversifying the risk, okay, spreading the risk. The idea here is that obviously you want to put into appropriate mix of unit trust funds uh, that provides a broad diversification within that asset class. And you know, we'll talk about it again just now. Maybe this way you want to consider some of the PSG funds. Um, And this is where it's important. And this is what I've learned over the long term. That, um, you know, the market doesn't stay where it is. It moves up and down. And that's asset allocation. You want to be able to handle through all market conditions. So we talk about rebalancing the portfolio. And especially when you come to your retirement, now you start withdrawing the funds out. You need to withdraw that all the time. And, and uh, 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 on, a, on, a, on an annual basis, and this is what most people do, on, a, on an annual basis, they rebalance that portfolio because of the withdrawals, that, that income from your investments. So, but the still stick to your, 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 your plan, talk it that way. Okay. And then what's also very important, do not change the asset allocation due to the market, uh, to what, uh, what's happening in the market. We saw at the beginning of the year, a um, lot of nervousness, a lot of volatility in the market, a lot of people got spooked and they rush out and go, uh, and go sell things. Okay, no, you don't want to be doing that. Remember, your portfolio is based on your long-term needs. Okay, so it should be, maintain a long-term view. Okay, if you're prepared, you know, if you're not willing to hold an asset or fund for at least 10 years, then you shouldn't own it. Anything longer, you know, if you want anything less than that period, then you should be more in, in, in cash, call it that way. Okay. So the idea is that you want to build and hold your portfolio for the long term. And the sixth um, call it rule that builds up in all of this is don't, do not hold back. So yes, the market pulls back a bit. Um, and a lot of us will say, well, you know, the market's falling. I'm not going to contribute anymore. And this is what I found. Rank cost averaging is powerful. So you're going to buy more units when the market falls. And obviously when the market recovers, you'll be buying less and less units. So I found it's easier to have a debit order in place. Uh, which makes it automatic, um, but also the, the, the idea here yeah, that you want to form good habits and then doing that consistently. Okay, so that's just as a quick outline into the six uh, um, disciplined rules, disciplined ways of, of investing. Um, so what are we proposing today? Are we talking about, just today we're talking about the equity market, so you can look at the local share portfolio. Um, some of you might be looking at exchange traded funds as a separate uh, portfolio, or you might have exchange traded uh, funds as part of your normal share portfolio, and there's, there's a core and, and a satellite approach. You might have a portfolio of offshore shares. Um, the, the challenge with this, and this is what I've come to a conclusion, you have to get to the stage where you have to withdraw uh, funds uh, for, for income purposes. So either going to build up a, a large portfolio that's going to give you dividends, um, or you have to start selling those shares off, and obviously that's going to trigger capital gains tax and things like that. So be aware of that. Um, on the other side, and by the way, this is on the left-hand side here, this is your do-it-yourself approach, where you can give your money to a broker and he handles it for you. Yeah, we're talking about indirect approach for unit trusts, um, retirement annuities, but more importantly, I find this side, and this is what I've learned over the year, over the last few months, tax-efficient products. So retirement annuities, you know, 27.5% uh, um, that you can, uh, on your contributions, um, deduct, okay? Tax-free investments, uh, savings plan, all those kind of uh, tax-free savings plans, use these tools. And those of you that are more worried about uh, uh, living a, a legacy and estate planning is important to consider endowments. We spoke about this a, a week or so ago. Endowments, those of you who have family trust, consider endowments. By the way, we'll be discussing that in next week's webinar. So these are some of the vehicles just on the equity side that you can use. So what will this do? And this is we're going to talk about the, 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 the myths 
okay, around um, long term long term investing. So first of all, you have to ask yourself, uh, what is a myth? A myth is a traditional story. If I use an example, the belief in Father Christmas when it comes to Christmas time is a healthy and long-standing and powerful tradition for many families, especially the children. Okay, things that also like the two fairy and things like the Easter bunny. You know, it helps you know, creates fun in the family and obviously creates uh, it helps uh, the child's the child's imagination. Okay, but a myth can also be a, a widely held and false belief or idea. And when it comes to retirement, this is where a lot of people are getting misled. So let's talk about the first myth. And the first myth here is my expenses will be lower in retirement. We touched on it earlier. We talked about income statement. Do you really expect your lifestyle to drastically change? And um, yeah, and there's two sides of the coin of this, obviously, first of all. Um, first of all, you'll get that scenario where, you know, inflation, um, your medical expenses we spoke about before, uh, the cost of living might be might be a bit higher, so um, <laughs> you have to take any considerations. And also, what's important is that uh, you'll have more free time. So, um, you know, if you've got more free time, you usually spend more money. Number one, and number two, you might be doing uh, you're pursuing hobbies that going to cost money. But, but besides your transport costs, okay, and your daily lunch money, what else you plan to cut back? So you need to take this all in consideration. But as I say, the cost of living might be higher so you need to uh, make sure that you know if you're going to uh, uh, withdraw five percent a month of your income you must make sure that your portfolio is also growing more than that okay so your expenses doesn't necessarily have to be lower so you know <laughs> be aware of that number one number two i will pay fewer taxes when i retire yeah just because you have less income okay does not necessarily mean that you'll be taxed at a lower rate so, um, you know, you have to look at what they call tax tables. Your income will be on tax tables. Um, depending on what you're using, um, you know, it's important to have this, consider especially tax when it comes to your retirement planning. And I've added, sorry, let me just go up here, just show you quickly. I've added a, I've hidden the slide for you guys um, where we spoke about um, withdrawal funds on the lump sum this is especially on our retirement annuities. Your first lump sum is 500,000 tax free. But this one I refer to here, yeah, that income. So these are the tax tables. It depends on how much income you're pulling out. Um, those you must be aware, you'll be paying 18, 27, and 36% tax. Okay, so be aware of that. Sorry, I just wanted to highlight it. It's headed for you. Um, but aware of that. Number three. I need to get out of shares when I retire. And I think this is where a lot of people go wrong. Um, you know, yes, investing your retirement savings in the stock market has risks. Okay. But investing in shares, especially exposure to shares, will greatly provide long-term growth, especially beating inflation. And we're talking about in the next, the next few slides, we talk about longevity. People are long, living longer into retirement. So it's important that you uh, Cater for that. Your retirement can span a few more years after retiring. So it's very important that you allocate a large, I believe, a large portion of your funds to a diversified share portfolio, but especially take advantage of the equity side. Okay. And before, I would not be financially responsible for my parents or children. And this is where I've, uh, I've become to the conclusion that I know I would fool myself. I'm part of the sandwich generation, if I had to put it that way. Whoops. Um, bring up my locus here. Um, I've learned that I'm sandwich generation. I'm the person. I'm the, the group of people that I have to take care of both my children and my parents. Okay, so I think a lot of you also will be falling into that into that category. Um, so yeah, don't fool yourself. Um, how are your children financially? Obviously, there's two people that are older, left home now, working for themselves. Number one, number two, you might have elderly parents that are dependent on you. So, um, yeah, take it into consideration. And the fifth myth, uh, and this is, I think, uh, where a lot of people, I uh, believe, are, are falling short. People will continue to work late in life, do so because they're forced to. Not necessary, okay? They did a survey in the States where they found that um, a lot of people are living longer. But if you can, and this is where I've speaking to a lot of financial advisors, delay your retirement as much as you can, okay? 
they did a survey in, in the States and they found that um, at least, well, you know, some 61% uh, of, the, of the workers indicated they liked to work. So they carried on working past retirement age. And they found that 40% of those people said they, they felt, those people felt valued, they felt uh, they, had, they had a purpose and they were contributing. You know, a lot of people will retire, they've got nothing to do, they get bored, and uh, their lifespan, you know, they're having to work towards and they die. <laughs> okay. But uh, they found in the survey that a solid majority of these people, once retired, were generally satisfied with the situation. In other words, they had enough, they'd saved up work to work more to save up more. So they also found that retirement age or retirement time was more the most rewarding time of their whole lives. In other words, they found that they, a very similar percentage, found that they retired at the right time. People are living, and you'll see there's a, a, a quote, uh, no, sorry, quote, I, I was looking it up on, 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 on Wikipedia, um, how many people actually live over the age of, of 100. In the, United, in the United States, the greatest number, uh, the United States is currently the greatest number of known centen centenarians uh, of any nation, with 53,554 uh, 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 centenarians, 53,000 people living over 100 years old. Okay, that was based on the consensus. Um, in, in 2013, 82% um, of them were female. So that just made me realize, gee, you know, women need more financial education, and obviously the, 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 the husband needs more, finan more estate planning and those kind of things to, to, to look after his wife. Okay, so those are just some of the myths or five myths that I want to cover today. So in considerations, you guys might be having a lot of questions and things like that, so I need to space your questions. Remember the whole idea, you have these different investment vehicles, and I want to highlight it for you guys again, is yes, you want to build up the income, um, but the idea is, is tax efficiency, number one, and obviously the income from that. Okay, so you might want to consider the PSG funds. We've got a whole range. We've got a South African uh, portfolio, and we've got range of so you can go have exposure offshore. Um, if you click on this little list at the bottom here, to take you through to the ATZ list, there's more than than 400 funds on our on our on our platform. So why would you want to consider PSG funds? Just from the from a cost point of view, um, I'll come back to that just now. Um, here we go. Costs. So obviously, the range of funds we've got on our platform, the support you've got, but also the costs, the reduced costs. If you buy into PSG funds, the um, on grade platform for you is 0.2%. Okay, with that 0.28 percent, so very cheap and affordable. So let's talk about um, the PSG funds. And if you look at the longer term, our funds have outperformed. Okay, just obviously the last two years. And I spoke to the guys at PSG Asset Management, and they say yes, they, they acknowledge uh, their short-term performance lagged in 2008, uh, 2015. Okay, um, they were early buyers. Of cyclical shares, they admit that. Um, but the current positioning, and this is what I, 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 I felt heartened by, the current positioning offers a compelling reason for buying. So those of you that are looking at uh, some funds, as they consider PSG funds, the PSG asset management, they have an uh, investment philosophy uh, where they're looking for mispriced quality stocks. They have this what they call the 3M approach. And those of you who've been to the presentations before, we talk about moat. Um, a management and the margin of safety. But right now, a lot of the funds are, off, are offering attractive prices. Um, the investment style, they're more value investors um, as opposed to a lot of the other funds which are more growth and momentum style funds. Um, they remain confident, PG Asset Management remain confident that the value-based investment philosophy, philosophy and the process is a way to unlock the long-term success. So they're very optimistic uh, about situations right now. Um, so as I say, go look at the at the funds um, going forward. Here's a quote from Warren Buffett again: "A very rich person should leave the leave his kids enough to do anything, but not enough to do nothing." Okay. So that's also some food for thought um, with, regarding your legacy. So let's see what questions you guys have got. Okay, let me just maximize the screen quickly. Let me put back on my 
webcam. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let me just maximize my screen here quickly. The questions. Okay. Uh, Stella, everybody, uh, uh, Stella says she's going to have voice on your video. Um, internet problems. Okay, let me see your questions. Tony, um, Tony's got a good question here on I'm looking for medical industry ETFs, unfortunately, in South Africa, not specifically just on that sector. Um, offshore, I know there is. Uh, especially on the New York Stock Exchange and that kind of stuff, bio, bio uh, chemistry and bio, all those kind of sectors. I uh, have a question here from Graham. Um, is there an ideal percentage for each asset? There's no ideal. Everybody's, um, uh, Graham's asking, is there an ideal percentage for each asset allocation? Um, there's no ideal. Depends on obviously your needs and things like that. Um, depends also on your style and your risk profile, Graham. So there's no ideal. So it's a difficult question to answer there. Ideal, okay, okay, like there's all questions coming through. Like a majority of had internet problems. Sorry to hear that. Some of you are fine and some of you are not. Uh, Steve, uh, did I mention Equinox? No, Equinox is part of PSG Wealth. So it's all on the same platform now, Steve. So, Tony Moore, uh, buying and managing my own group of shares. Uh, Tony, I'm not 100% sure of your question there. I'm looking at for medical industry ETFs. That would mean, I presume, going on to medical ETFs. Um, yeah, it would mean, it mean obviously managing your own portfolio, uh, having exposure to that. Uh, first of all, uh, opening up an offshore account and then buying into those um, ETFs that are exposed to the medical sector. Uh, as I say, in South Africa, unless you go physically go look at all those different medical stocks, the Medic Midlands and the Aspens, all those kind of things. Okay. All the questions coming in now. Awesome. Okay, let me see what other questions I've got here. As a long term uh, Kerber, yeah, question from Kerbers, as a long term investor in equities, which do you consider the best approach? Investing in companies paying high dividends or growth companies? Uh, <laughs> um, difficult question. And uh, again, comes to your risk profile. Depends on your on your needs. My, my, me personally, um, my mixture, my long term portfolio is some value stocks. Um, growth stocks, um, and also I have uh, uh, shares that are paying high dividends. So is that mixture. So Quivis, um, you know, the do-it-yourself approach, uh, you have to manage that. Um, you need to outperform the market, so you need to develop some approach. I, I like a fruit salad approach, value, growth, and high dividend yielding stocks. I hope that answers your question, Quivis. Okay, uh, AJ, this is a question from AJ. Again, I'm not a financial planner. What is your recommended asset class mix for the ideal retirement portfolio? Um, yet, obviously, a large, a large portion towards um, equities, um, to, to income, to, to security or interest bearing securities, as well as um, cash, um, a balanced portfolio, uh, you know, balanced unit trust portfolio. Uh, one way to look at it. <laughs> okay, so I hope that answers your question, AJ. Okay, uh, Danny, it looks like I've answered your question. Uh, Question here from Maladi. What is the minimum investment on the different local products? Monthly and lump sum. What is the admin fee? Minimum investment on the different local products. Um, when it comes to, to good question, Maladi, when it comes to equities, there's no minimum. 
Um, this is if you do it yourself, pulling up a share portfolio. That, there's no minimum, but obviously you take in consideration the costs. You have PSG Wealth, our minimum brokerage fee is, is works on a sliding scale, 0.9%, up to 25,000, um, with a minimum of 98 rand per trade. So with a 1,000 rand, for example, your share has to move up 9.8% to break even. Um, I suggest, as a starting point, 10,000 rand, then your cost as a percentage is 1%. So that's how you start building a, portf a, a portfolio. Um, the admin fee on an equity portfolio is 40 rand per month. Um, on a unit trust, by the way, you can start with a little 5 rand a month debit order. Um, however, the lump sum of the minimum is 20,000, which just makes it economically viable. As I say, consider the, the, the platform fee on the PSG funds is, is only 0.2%, so it's very, very cheap. Um, Andres, I'm not 100% sure of your question. What is the rule of thumb once net asset value or at retirement exam, and also at, at retirement, and also every time retirement is 10? Mm, not 100% sure on that question, Andres. Question here is a comment from Colin, and I appreciate you, Colin. Uh, a comment from from Colin it says um, Alexander Forbes also say that at retirement we still generate 40% of our savings after that time, like like staying invested in shares, as, uh, as I mentioned. Okay. Um, for diverse trades, yeah, how much offshore? Um, <laughs> Steve, quite a good question. Um, you know, there was a stage a few months ago where the guys were punting offshore exposure, ran weakness and things like that. And I mentioned before in previous webinars, do not invest offshore because of ran weakness. You want to diversify offshore for geopolitical reasons, whatever the case might be, but just take advantage of other offshore. So, um, you know, how much offshore? Uh, I like to diversify as much as I can offshore. I don't like to have all my eggs in one basket. It's a difficult question again. You know, our minimum requirement for offshore, going back to Malari's question, is at least under thousand. Convert that, divide that by by fifteen thousand, fifteen rand to the dollar, um, doesn't mean a lot. So um, you know, as much as you can, your first million is tax. You know, you don't need a tax clearance. Um, up to ten million, obviously, you do need some tax clearance. But take as much as you can offshore. Um, if you don't want to take advantage of your offshore allowance, you also got the asset swap facility. Um, and there, there's no limitations on there. But have exposure to offshore. I believe there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities in the US, there's a lot of opportunities in the UK. Yes, the UK market has come off lots to do with the Brexit, but there's opportunities, especially in Europe. But put your, your money in, in other baskets too. So, Steve, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay. That looks like uh, all the questions that come through. Cool. Okay. So guys, just quickly we just minimize this again. Take it out of the way, rather. Uh, questions. So in conclusion, okay, what I want you to remember from this presentation, those six rules. So I go review those rules again. Remember, it just builds on the, on the previous slides. Those five, five myths. A lot of you guys would have been aware of it, but in reality, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of other things you have to take into consideration. Those investment cho choices, those different investment vehicles, um, you, know, you want to build up an asset base. Those are some of the suggestions you want to look at. And then obviously consider our PhD funds. So uh, what to do next? Um, next action steps for more information on what, what PhD offers. You can go click on this little link to take you through to all our all those different products I was talking about earlier on. Um, if you've got any further questions, you're welcome to contact our client service department or the other phone numbers. Okay. But from my side, I appreciate you guys taking out the time, uh, your busy schedule to be here today. Um, next week, as I say, we're talking about family trusts and how to use that uh, as a vehicle. And there's a lot of um, changes happening in that, on that side. On the 25th of May, we're talking more fundamentals. So we talk about seven, I talk about uh, Magnificent Seven, seven, um, shares that we think might be offering opportunities. Those of you are more the long-term equity investors. So, uh, and as I say, we're focusing on more the uh, fundamentals that day. In June, we talk about um, uh, very much what we spoke about today. Um, when is enough is enough? When 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 have you, when will you have enough for retirement? 
Um, yeah, in the middle of June or April, June, we're talking about uh, uh, currency futures, single stock futures thereafter, uh, all, all the trading and things like that. Okay, so those are our coming webinars. Our seminars look like we, uh, we're moving to um, my annual at this point in time. So we're looking at the end of June or middle of June rather, and, and it'll be around the country. So we may be Joburg, Durban and Cape Town, um, and we'll see how it goes from there. Okay, but guys from my side, again, thanks for being on this webinar. There's my contact details, uh, email address, there's our switchboard number, toll-free number. Um, I hope you found benefit or found uh, something out of this webinar today presentation. As I said, I will be sending this to you guys. Um, but from my side, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and again, there's my disclaimer. There's all uh, members for education purposes. No, no advice uh, should be taken here as literal. Uh, education purposes only. Okay, but uh, thanks a lot for being on this webinar. Until next week, all the best. Bye for now.